Good evening from the Gail Lamron Auditorium on the campus of Embry-Riddle. Welcome to the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series event. I'm Mark Bernier, moderator for tonight's interview. How often have you thought of what would happen if we were hacked by a foreign country? Have you ever wondered if the money in your bank account is secured? And what about that email that came from someone you haven't talked to in about 12 to 15 years? Should you open that attachment? Just some of the issues we're going to talk about, plus Facebook and analytics. Lots of technical terms that will be broken down by our panel tonight joining us as we talk about cybersecurity, what's next for you. We begin by introducing the panel and we're going to jump right into it. He is an associate professor of cybersecurity and a returning member to this panel. Please welcome Dr. Philip Krager. Also, the inspiration for doing these, and I think this is probably our third or fourth event uh, working with this next gentleman, the Professor of Homeland Security, and Department Chair at the Department of Security Studies and International Affairs. I think he needs two business cards to get all that in. Please, Dr. Gary Kessler. <laughs> and a former graduate of Embry-Riddle, now the President and Founder of Total Digital Security, ladies and gentlemen, Brad Deflin. And you'll be able to learn more about Brad's company at totaldigitalsecurity.com. We're going to talk about this from different angles. Let's jump right into it. There was a Monmouth University study that came out today, gentlemen, that says that 82% of Americans feel they're being watched at all times. Shocked and appalled or not? Jump in, anyone. I'm shocked that it was that low. <laughs> Uh, yes, we are being watched at all times, and when you think of being watched, you automatically think of the government. But it's not just the government, it's, it's corporations. You know, we are a product, for example, when it comes to Google and Facebooks and things we sign up on and the products they use, the reason it's free is they're collecting data on us, and then they're sharing that and they're doing data analytics with it, and they're sharing it with other corporations. So yeah, we are being spied on. Not spied on, we even watched. Gary, do you find that when you talk to people who may not be students, who live on their computers, on their phones, that some people say they're now starting to be afraid to even go on the computer because they don't know what they're going to find when they turn it on and log in? Um, I, I use my wife as an example. Um, we've been married now about 11 years, and I've made her uh, almost as, as paranoid as I am. Um, I'm a professional paranoid. Um, more and more people are aware that there are things they need to be worried about, but they don't necessarily change their behavior. As Phil said, um, we are being watched because, you know, Facebook and Google, but we're putting the stuff there to be seen. It's not like they're digging very deep. We're, we're, we're helping. So there's not a lot of data mining going on that's causing all this, or is there? Well, there's a fair amount of data mining, but again, we're, we're supplying the information. So people are concerned, but, you know, I, people will frequently talk about, you know, the NSA spying on me. Um, I don't like that. I don't like the government intrusion, yet they don't think about the fact that, you know, as, as, again, as Phil says, we're a commodity to Facebook, we're a commodity to Google. And, and, and you know that has to be true because you will go to Amazon and, and look up something that you might want to buy. And all of a sudden, do you notice that every time you go to a news site or any place else that has ads, all of a sudden there are ads that are clearly targeted to the things you have been searching for. Obviously, uh, people are putting this stuff together. Brad, a little background from you. When you graduated from Embry-Riddle, did you ever think you'd be doing what you're doing now? No, never occurred to me. Well, okay, when you came out, a little background. Where were you going and how did you fall into this? So my first job was as a flight instructor and then I flew commercially for a little while. Um, during the 80s, the part 121 industry was going through a lot of changes and I found opportunity to innovate and build businesses in that environment. And then I um, got into the business of Wall Street, if you will. But it occurred to me, uh, looking back, that the cockpit is such a great place to study people, uh, technology and risk and how those three things come together and how you can manage that effectively. So a lot of that, though it would have never occurred to me, absolutely comes into play today. Okay, with total security, mm -hmm. what's the percentage of your business that's the general consumer as opposed to your business clients that you consult for? It's now about 50-50, but it started where it was 100% individuals. We, we started, uh, by definition, 
going right to that intersection of people and their own technology because we felt that's the science that needed to be understood because of what was going to happen with the advent of the internet and data mining and a lot of the things that we're talking about now. And we knew what we learned at that intersection of people and their technology would absolutely apply up the food chain through the business environment. And indeed it does. So a lot of our data, a lot of our observations and insights and experiential knowledge is being found really valuable by the corporate sector. Okay, let's go to the national first. We're gonna go between the national issues and your own consumer issues and questions. So there'll be a, a very quick ride through all of this. Let's begin with the Russians. It was back in the news last week. The Russians have infiltrated us for a number of things. Let's talk about the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is the election. Did they interfere, in your opinion, Gary Kessler, with the election? Um, I, I think it's clear that there was interference. Um, I think the, sometimes we misfocus on thinking they somehow, um, you know, hacked into the, the, the ballot box or they changed counts and things like that. I, I have seen no data that suggests that they did that. But certainly with what we've learned about Cambridge Analytics, it, it is just merely one more piece of data that reinforces, I think, stuff we already knew, and that was they were absolutely affecting the news um, and they were affecting um, information that was being repeated. And, and you mentioned a study that came out this morning. There have been any number of studies that have come out, um, again, showing the obvious that bad news in social media um, tweets further or Facebooks further is repeated way more than, um, than, than, than good news. And partially it's because it's what people want to believe. Sometimes it's the outlier information. And so all you need to do is plant a few what are truly are fake stories, and, and they, get, they get replicated all over the place, which I believe is certainly what we've seen. Let's do the follow-up. They talked about hacking into aviation and some of our infrastructure. Gary, what do we know? Well, separate from the Cambridge Analytics, you know, there, there was a report that came out late last week from the U.S. CERT office. Um, DHS and FBI were reporting actually in, in really, really good detail. Um, some of the attacks that have happened recently on critical infrastructures, particularly the energy sector, as well as aviation, as well as maritime. Um, and, and, and one of the most interesting things that came out of that for me, because it, it certainly resonates with stuff that, that Brad has been saying and Phil and I have been saying for a while, is one of the vectors was if, if I have a target and the target is too hard to get into, obviously I try to find another vector. Well, when you're a big company, you have a supply chain and you've got all sorts of other companies that are trusted by you and therefore they have access into your network that you know, the general internet obviously does not. And so what the Russians were doing were that they were actually finding the weaker partners and they were breaking into the weaker partners, weaker in the sense of weaker security. And once they were in as the partner and could pretend to be the partner, they now had access into some of these, um, th these other places. Um, and, and the part, again, that resonates, I think, with stuff that, that Phil and Brad and I have been saying independently, yet simultaneously for the last X number of years, is you know, we're constantly asked, why does anybody want to break into my computer at home? What information do I have on my computer? I have nothing to hide. I have, well, oh, right, yeah, exactly, I have nothing to hide. Um, my, my life is an open book um, until somebody opens it. Um, and, 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 and so what we find, though, is that my computer, if there's enough of them, can be used as a vector to get into other places. Um, people will get into my computer to steal my credentials so they can get into my bank. Um, and it provides a vector into the bank. Um, and, and so, you know, every computer on the internet counts. Um, and we're all ultimately interconnected. And many of the attacks that we see, we'll probably talk later on, we hear about um, distributed denial of service attacks. Well, distributed denial of service attacks happen when hundreds of thousands or more computers attack one victim. Well, if somebody can compromise each of our computers in this room, we all become potential attackers under the control of somebody else. And again, we're seeing many examples of that uh, now, and like I said, probably stuff we'll talk about later on. You can speak to an issue, and I, I bring this up because when I heard about it, I was shocked. This is the tax filing season, friends and neighbors. And there are people who have gotten notices saying that 
Well, you've already filed your taxes. To right, the I did a couple of years ago, yeah. Right, explain to our audience what happened and how did you work through that? Uh, it happened a couple of years ago and uh, the, the IRS said that somebody had, try, had tried to file a tax return in my name. And the only way to do that is if they had some personally identifying information. Um, and, you know, your name, your social security number, where you work, uh, where you live. Um, and so the good thing about that was that I owed several thousand dollars to the IRS, so they didn't get any money out of it. Uh, but um, that, that's the issue now uh, with, with tax filing season is that with all of these data breaches, for example, you consider the Equifax breach, there were 145 million records stolen from the Equifax breach, which means that probably hit most of you in here. Uh, and so that's, that was like the fourth or fifth breach of my personal information that occurred. And so it didn't affect me in terms of the IRS, but I started thinking in terms of identity theft. And most people think that credit card fraud is a big deal. Well, it's not, because I've had my credit card number stolen and used in several places, and I've never had to pay any of that that was, uh, they either caught it or I called them and I said, that's not mine, and they, they did a chargeback. Um, but with identity theft, if they steal your personal, your PII it's called, is that they can get credit in your name. So they could be in Washington State, they can buy a boat in my, in my name, and then they can sell it. So they no longer have it. Guess who pays for it? I do. And it takes forever to get those things taken off of your credit report, you know, and taken off. It's very stressful. Um, and so what I did immediately was did something called a credit freeze which at that time was, was $10, which means that you can no longer get credit in your name, it's frozen. No one can get credit no matter, no matter how much information they have on you. So you go to the three bureaus and you do a credit freeze and you're pretty good in terms of somebody being able to get credit in your name, including yourself. Yeah, so until you need to buy a car or go for a mortgage or something, you gotta get it unfrozen. Well, you, 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 you do something, you, you unfreeze it or you thaw it, you can thaw it for a day, then they check your credit report, and then you can immediately go back to have it frozen. And okay. so I'm, I'm much less worried about identity theft than I was a few years ago. And actually, you wouldn't know this, but people above 65 in Florida can do a freeze for free. Why oh. would I know that? Exactly. <laughs> That's, <laughs> all right, but let I me do. ask the audience, okay. show of hands, how many have had a credit card statement come back and say there's a charge on there, and you've been able to say, I didn't make that charge. That luggage that was purchased in Spain was not from me. Show of hands, how many? Oh my. Are you all surprised that based on what's, this what's audience that there's that many? No. Or do you think right. that's low? What's your guess? No, it's probably about right. It's about right? Third. Okay, Phil, staying with you for a moment, then I want to come over to Brad. It's a mess. It happened to me. They say that my identity may have been stolen at a gas pump in Miami when I went to Miami-Dade College for the book fair. And I had to, with American Express, I had to change it. Then I had to notify all the vendors that were on reoccurring. It, could I have done something better? Could I have bought a service or done something that would have prevented that or me going through that? I think you're confusing two different things, credit card fraud and identity theft. Credit card fraud is just your credit card number. Okay. It has very, it does have some personal information on there. Identity theft is used to obtain credit. Okay. Uh, when you have an issue with your credit card, you can, you can cancel your credit card, do the chargebacks, and get a new credit card. But if somebody gets credit in your name, it's a much bigger deal. Okay. Uh, in terms of somebody stealing your credit card in Miami, uh, a lot of times uh, that's done through something called a hardware skimmer. And so what that is is you, you go to a bank or you go to a place where you insert your credit card, okay, or actually more specifically, you swipe your credit card, and criminals have a way of creating uh, fake frontal portions that mimic the front of the credit card. So when you're skimming, the information is actually being taken off the credit card. Later on, they can come back and take off the physical device. And they've also got ways to connect to that now via Bluetooth from a remote place so they don't have to get near the, the skimmer. And that, that's a big deal everywhere and that you see that quite a lot in Volusia County as well. So I'm wondering, Brad, the rule of thumb has been if you come up to something where you have to swipe your credit card, check it to make sure one of those covers is not on it? Yeah, you, you should visually be able to check it and make sure it's legitimate. Sometimes you see these um, pieces of tape that are sort of authorized and verify that it's okay. 
but I think it brings up maybe a bigger point, and that is we're never going to eliminate this risk, right? We can take all the precautions in the world, be as aware as anybody else. You're never going to eliminate it. What you have to be able to do is respond. You know, back to the cockpit analogy, uh, we will not eliminate um, unforeseen events in the cockpit. So you have to know how you will respond in the event of having something that you weren't necessarily planning on. The same thing applies here. Um, I'd just like to say, because I think it would be helpful, um, first of all, Florida is the number one state in the country for IRS tax fraud. And this is where somebody else steals um, your identity with the IRS, if you will, in order to kind of get in front of you from a tax filing, claim a refund, they get the refund, and you stand in line in Miami to the IRS office for three or four days just to start to get it sorted out. Um, so we would recommend you get a PIN, a personal identification number, with the IRS, but you not do that online because hackers do watch for your entries and they will steal that electronic PIN, but you can choose to receive that by U.S. mail. And with a PIN through the U.S. mail, you have done as much as you can at this current time to closely eliminate that particular risk. But sometimes, Phil, the pins run out. I just have a weird story about that. So they did require me to use the pen after that episode. So I called in and I said, I'm calling in about a pen. And, they, and I said, because my, um, somebody had submitted a um, tax return in my name. And they looked, they said, hold on a minute. And they came in, I'm sorry, they've all run out. Oh, we don't. Geez. We don't. The IRS have, was running out. We don't of have any more. It's, it's yeah. not like a physical thing. There's just a. It's just a number. Yes, but that was just right. totally so. Digits. FYI. Yeah. Well, so. actually, if I could jump in on one little thing, because it's actually uh, part of a, a lesson of unintended consequences. One of the reasons that so much IRS fraud works right now is because in the old days, it used to take forever to get a refund. And then the law got changed and said the IRS, when a refund comes in, they have to pay you. I think within two weeks. Something like that? 21 Two, days. Weeks. 21 days, okay. So what that means is they, don't have, they can't possibly process your return in 21 days. What happens is your return comes in, they owe you money, they send the check, then they process <clears> it. And so what it means is that the criminals now have a great opportunity to, and, and we've seen all sorts of um, shows about this, where they just have filing mills. They got a bunch of people sitting in a room just filling out tax returns, requesting money back. Oh, man. Twenty billion dollars last year in Florida. Yeah. Twenty twenty-two billion dollars in ben Florida. Billion, yeah, billion yeah. in Florida from the IRS. So is the is this a losing game for the IRS? I mean, are they hopelessly off behind? They must be doing a cost-benefit analysis of that to say, you know, we're willing to pay this out. You know, well, I, I'm, I'm wondering if the legislators um, are willing to say, no, we're going to let you spend your time and do your due diligence and save that money. But it might take you now 42 days to get paid instead of 21. Which is going to anger the voters. Which will anger voters and, you know, how, yeah. Wow. All right, let's jump to Facebook. How many people on Facebook in this audience? Yeah, All right, well, the know. analytics. <laughs> Facebook, very controversial over the last week for a couple of reasons. Analytics, stock price <clears throat> fell. What's going on with the company? <laughs> You're looking they, at me for they, some reason. Phil? I Look how I deflected I'm that. No, the password is bad. Yeah. We're, we're learning something every day about what they've been doing, and they don't have a tight control of their data. Yeah. No, I think, uh, Phil, you said it up front. If, um, if something's for free on the Internet, it's because you are the product. Uh, think about every 25-year-old billionaire you've ever heard of. Right? They're probably giving you something for free on the Internet. And they didn't make a billion dollars by the age of 25 because you were winning that particular trade. <laughs> they are arbitraging our lack of understanding and respect for our personal information, their deep understanding of the value of it. And so every time you're on Facebook, and I'm on Facebook for all the reasons anybody else is on Facebook, but you have to be a lot more thoughtful. Now this breach, mm -hmm. you know, I have to sort of scratch my head because I use Facebook ads. Anybody use Facebook ads in the room? I mean, what an unbelievably powerful platform. And I don't need to steal anything from anybody, but I can go into Facebook ads and micro-target demographically eight people in a zip code if I want to. And what the Russians have done is they, they, they want to be a foil. I don't know that they favored one candidate or another, but they definitely favored dividing the country, creating divisive issues. So they find people that might be on the fringes of the extreme, 
and keep putting stuff in front of them that pushes to those extremes, whether it's one candidate or another, creating that divisiveness. So where they got this information or where they got this data, to me is not the most interesting thing because it's out there and somebody's gonna get it if it's legitimate or not, it's going to happen. And, and the problem I think is exacerbated by the fact that people ignore any message that is not consistent with their beliefs yes. and they glom onto anything that is consistent with their beliefs. So in fact, I can be putting out a hundred messages and you're going to read the 48 that you already agreed with and you're going to ignore the 52. And I think that's just human nature. Yeah. By the uh, way, you know, we talk about the Russians. Are the Chinese and the North Koreans in this business, by the way? Given the shiny object nature of people, we haven't heard about the North Koreans and the Chinese in at least a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in this business. <clears throat> Are they in I, it? I don't know that the Chinese have been big into this. We tend no, to associate found, no. them more with intellectual, intellectual property, property theft. theft. Yeah. And yeah. I think what's interesting what the Chinese are doing is, for example, they outlawed VPNs, right? And yeah. Normal citizens can't own a VPN, which means you can't use encryption to protect your information from others. Think about how important personal information must be to a government to outlaw. Right. Typically, when an outlaw starts, when a government starts taking away something from you, it was like a slip gold, right there. Yeah. Right, oh. <laughs> right. That's probably something you want to regain control of. Just the nature of government. Now, the North Koreans. Think about if you're a nation state that's running terrible deficits and you're being isolated by the rest of the world. What an attractive element of warfare, which is very effective profitable, and while you're going looky up there at the ICBMs, you're really running the counterattack under the undersea fiber optic cables and doing more socioeconomic damage with no retaliation. Naturally, they will take on these arms. And we said last time we were here, the history of nations is the history of weapons, and cyber is the leading weapon today. Used to be that when we were kids, you didn't eat food that would keep you up all night, you know? How about this for information that might keep you up all night? Do we need to worry that the Chinese, the Russians, the North Koreans, or any other devious force might want to just shut off our electricity? And could they do it with something outside of an electromagnetic pulse? Could they hack in and affect the, t the TVA in Tennessee or a major grid for electricity for the Northeast or for the South? Could that happen? Well, it's happened a couple of times already, not in the United States. But it's happened in Ukraine a couple of times, one in 2015 and one in 2016, when allegedly the Russians shut down their electrical grid. There were 230,000 people without power for a while. Um, they're also now, as Gary suggested earlier, um, the Department of Homeland Security has identified that the Russians are now, have been in our electrical grid. Now, have they turned off anything? Have they done anything? We don't, obviously they haven't turned off anything because I think we would know that. But I think what they're doing is, is they're, um, gaining the capability of being able to do that should it so be warranted if we attack them first or if um, either cyber wise or kinetically. This is often considered one of the greatest advancements of our lifetime and also the bane of our existence. It could be used for all kinds of reasons and I'm wondering what's next for phones. This is a broad question. Let me begin with you Brad. Um, people won't need laptops, they won't need, they're already, most students don't even use a regular computer, their phone is their right. computer. What happens next for phones? Right. Well, first of all, a lot of people in the room might not know that more humans on the planet have one of these than has access to a toilet. Wow. Right now, today. A supercomputer, and by any measurement over any period of time, this is a supercomputer, more powerful by thousands of degrees than computers just 15 or 20 years ago. So what does it mean when most of the world's population has a supercomputer in the palm of their hand that is also connected? So you have two major drivers that have to be understood. And I think the sensibilities for survival and success in the digital age requires this. Number one, Moore's Law, which says these will continue to get more powerful and cheaper exponentially. About a 2x every 18 months in terms of power and about one half in terms of price, um, in terms of price, every year to two years. That means more people with more power. Number two, so Moore's Law is on one hand in terms of the exponential progress of these devices themselves. Number two is when these devices connect, it, we're now under a, a force known as the network effect or Metcalfe's Law. Every time one of these connects to the network, the network itself becomes more powerful. 
because all those connections are now available. Think about the world's first fax machine. How much value did that have? Zero. Who could you fax? Right? When you have two fax machines, it doubles in value because now you have a connection. But what happens is every time you add a node, the connections increase exponentially. So between processing power in increasing exponentially and that connectivity increasing exponentially, it's transformational. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to see, say that the transformation is really akin to any other revolution we've had in, during humanity or civilization, the Industrial Revolution, uh, for example. The digital age is absolutely comparable in terms of its effect on humankind as the Industrial Revolution was just 100 or 200 years ago. Can we do? Go ahead, Gary. Well, I, I was going to say that, I mean, just to follow on with what you said, Brad, is so not only do I have all of these, uh, they, they are supercomputers. I mean, my, my, my phone is a quad-core computer. I don't think my laptop is a quad-core computer. Um, so not only are they all connected, but in fact, I can figure out ways in which I can use unused compute power from all of these devices, and I can get them doing computing for me. And so one of the things that we sometimes hear about is something called crypto mining, where people are putting um, forms of malicious software, malware, on people's computers, and I'm not breaking into your computer, because I don't care what's on your computer. What I want are, is the CPU power of your phone of your, or of your computer when you are not otherwise occupying your phone. I mean, I'm sitting on my computer typing a Word document. You know, it takes me about eight seconds to type the word the. Well, all of the other processing power of my computer that's not being tapped, somebody else presumably could be using. Um, whether I know it or not, and they can be using it for their own profit or their own benefit or, or whatever. So, so indeed, um, yeah, not, not only are we adding more systems to this network, but to potentially bad guys, um, they're, they're, there's more access to compute power. I, I've referred to this as the democratization of global power. Anybody, anywhere can, can choose to harness this power and use it in nefarious ways or any other way that they want to exploit. They don't need to be in a certain location. They don't need armies. They don't need a lot of resources in order to do that. I want to get to GPS and Uber in a moment, but first, radiation. Is there a lot of radiation coming from these? I have on the back of my phone what looks like a cross. It's a symbol, it's a little disc that goes on the back that's supposed to try to reduce the radiation that comes from the phone. I also have something I wear on my wrist. They were gifts because there's a, a worry that they could be cancer-causing agents. Can any of you speak to that? Is there any reason for consumers, the general public, to be concerned that carrying a phone on their person in a certain area is dangerous? Dr. Mercola, some of you may know Dr. Mercola, he has a residence here, he lives in Chicago, has talked about this online a bit. Do you think it's hype or do you believe it? Beginning with you, Phil. <clears throat> I'm I'm not an expert in this area. Yeah, but just I've, a, I've, I'm asking I've for read, a general feel. I've, I've read um, some studies that suggest that prolonged use can cause issues, especially with um, causing cancer. Um, there was something in the news the other day that there was some uh, an Asian Asian young woman that was using the phone for 20 hours, and she had some kind of breakdown. And I think it's a physical breakdown. Uh, well, but that I, I believe I don't, too. I think all my students in here, when they're in class, they're always using their cell phones, right? <laughs> No, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not allowed. See, I hold mine up to my face, and a contractor locally developed cancer pituitary gland uh, that there was cancer there. And I was wondering, Gary, any thoughts on you know, that subject? To be honest with you, I don't know that I've read a good study that, that I understand and believe. Um, I believe that the phones today are um, putting out slightly less RF, and they're better shielded. But that's, you know, better and better only means it's a, that's just a relative term. Curiosity, the radio audience will appreciate this. How many think there may be some linkage to cancer and phone usage? Okay, a few in the audience. Let me move to GPS. We all have it in different ways. We have it in our phones. We used to have devices that we would put on the dash. Now it's built into your car. Good and bad of GPS, beginning with you, Brad, because it opens up a whole Pandora's box there, too. Go ahead. It does. So. Um it's a balance, right, between convenience and productivity and other values and priorities that you have in your life. I think that that applies to a lot of different elements of technology, and what it really takes is some critical thinking and some autonomy 
uh, in a certain sense that you want to retain some digital autonomy and be able to choose when you share that information, when you use that information, and when you do not. That's the important part. Gary? So actually, I, I, I've got a whole bunch of different thoughts about GPS that are not in any way contradictory to Brad's, just, just different. So some of the work that I do with um, aviation cybersecurity and maritime cybersecurity, there's been a lot of issues over the last um, several years with um, certain actors um, hacking into GPS. Uh, perhaps most famously, um, last June in the Black Sea, um, there were a number of vessels whose GPS was hacked and rather than thinking that they were on the east coast of the Black Sea, they thought they were 30 kilometers away in the middle of an airport. Now, the captains, not being any fools, were able to go out on the bridge and say, yep, I'm surrounded by water. I'm not at an airport, so that, that <laughs> part good. was okay. But, but it also um, screwed up these systems that showed ships' proximity to other ships. Because in this particular case, um, the, the first reporting master who took pictures of his, what's known as the automatic identification system screen, was able to show that he was within 100 meters of 14 other ships. That's because all of them thought they were at the airport. Um, and, and so, you know, you were talking before about cyber weapons and stuff. Um, cyber weapons are cheap, um, which is to say they don't really cost very much. Um, I can build up an, a, a cyber core probably cheaper than I can build ICBMs, but it's exactly correct um, what Brad said. I can build ICBMs, but that's not really the vector of attack I'm going to use. Because if I launch an ICBM at you, you can look at the heat signature and you know where it came from. And you're going to launch ICBMs back, a whole crap load of them. However, if I engage you in a cyber-based war, first of all, you have to attribute it to me in the first place accurately, and how do you respond? We're not quite yet ready for me to send ICBMs in your direction because you attacked me in a cyber war. Mm -hmm. But then the other last related note, you know, you were talking before about, you know, um, is there a capability to take out the electrical grid of the United States? Um, and it's unclear to me what the motivation would be for somebody to do that, because if they do it and I attribute it, I'm sending ICBMs. Um, however, you know, in, in years past, we talk about cyber war, and you know, obviously the, the attack vector is going to be the internet. And um, can I take out the internet? And I've always observed, well, it doesn't make sense for me if I'm attacking you to take out the internet because that's my attack vector. If I take out the internet, you know, no more attack vector. But the interesting thing with GPS is this. There are at least four major uh, global navigation systems worldwide. So there's not only GPS, which is our system, uh, but there's Galileo used by the European Union. Um, uh, now I'm phasing, of course, on the Russian um, system. So the point is, though, let's say, and I'm just going to make up the Russians. I don't really think that they're doing this. But So I've got all the Russians using their version of GPS. And if they can figure out a way to hack our GPS, all of a sudden, our people that are reliant on GPS are blind. But their people are not. So whereas I might not want to take out the internet, I might very well want to take out GPS. And, you know, again, it, these are some of the, you know, nightmare scenarios we sit around and, and, and conjure because, you know, that's basically what we need to do. I observed that the U.S. Navy in the late 1990s stopped teaching the use of sextants um, in the Naval Academy. Um, about three years ago, they started again reteaching midshipmen how to use sextants. I believe this was not to bring the love of the maritime tradition back to the Navy. I think it was because some poor guy is going to be the chief navigator on the Admiral's flagship, and they'd like to know exactly where in the West Pacific they are. Good. Additional viewpoint? Boy, that was a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> was very good. A li and I remembered all and of it without yeah, any thoughts on so I'm Getting back to two things. One is, is when you were asking Brad about China. Uh, one additional thing that China has done to restrict information flow is, and this has gone on for a while, is they have something called the Great Firewall. Yeah. The Great Firewall. And so they their have own the, people the government can. has their own firewall, and they can deny or allow you access to certain websites and certain information as a way of controlling their population. Uh, getting back to what Gary said in terms of attribution, um, that's exactly correct. It's much easier to see where an ICBM missile comes from, and NORAD sees where, they, where it comes from, than a cyber attack does. Because typically, you would think, okay, 
you would look at the originating IP address, I think everybody knows what an IP address is, and say, well, it comes from them, but, but only the most naive cyber attacker would use their own computer to originate an attack. They're gonna use somebody else's computer, or as Gary alluded to earlier with a distributed denial of service attack, it could be hundreds of thousands of different IP addresses, all from different countries, so you never know the exact origin of the attack, and that's why uh, cyber warfare is so tenuous, is that you certainly don't want to escalate an attack when it would, may turn out that the originating uh, actor was somebody other than whom you really originally thought it was. We're going to th take your questions very quickly, so start being ready. That's how fast these gentlemen work. Try this one on for size. A 15-year-old computer hacker, this is ABC News last September, a 15-year-old computer hacker caused a 21-day shutdown of NASA's computers in the International Space Station, invaded a Pentagon weapons computer, and was able to intercept 3,300 emails, steal passwords, and cruise around like an employee. He was the first young hacker to be incarcerated for computer crimes. According to the Justice Department, he was to serve six months in a state detention facility. Question, are we waiting for this to like, happen all the time? Or after this happened, I don't know if all you gentlemen were familiar with the story, did the government then put in some kind of roadblock that would prevent that from happening again? Or are we gonna, you know, some real bright student or, or a person who is really technically adept is going to just march right through and do this again. What do you think? Well, well, presumably, we learned from what they did so that it'll be harder next time. Um, secondly, you want to reread the list of what he did and put that in physical world and see if he'd get six months in jail? Yeah. 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 So, exactly. so, so there's something about the way we think that cyber is somehow not as bad as other stuff. And, and I think we're almost starting to see with cyber what, what street gangs are doing. And that is, you know, I'm the 22-year-old running drugs, but what I'm gonna do is give it to a 14-year-old to actually take from place to place, so when the 14-year-old gets arrested, you know, gets a slap on the wrist. I think there's already evidence that cyber, crime, uh, cyber gangs are doing the same thing. Oh. Cyber gangs, and you mentioned that in our briefing. Explain for our audience what a cyber gang is, how many may be in it, are they physically together, are they in different countries? What d d d well, defines a cyber gang? Cyber gang, I, I, I use the term sort of loosely, but basically it is um, any set of people working together for some nefarious reason. Um, I mean, one could call anonymous a cyber gang, but they're, they're in some ways even, even bigger than that. But, but, but they don't need to be co-located. I mean, that, that's one of the beauties of the internet, is I can now affect a crime, I don't even need to be in the same continent. As, as the victims. Um, so if I find um, either in the dark web or some underground mailing list, um, you know, I, I may find a couple of like-minded people and we all decide that we don't like United Airlines, I don't know, and, and, and we work together to try to break into them. Well, we just make sure that I've got the 15-year-old on the front line as we're all sort of mentoring and possibly even educating, um, you know, here's the next thing to do. And when you find this stuff, you know, just sort of guiding them through it. But, you know, in, in some ways, the 15-year-old becomes the sacrificial lamb because they're not actually going to send a 15-year-old to jail, right? They're going to do something restricting him for the next six months, but, you know, it's going to be a slap on the wrist. Compared. And they don't want to make him a cost celeb. Well, they absolutely don't want to do that. What, a member of our audience wanted me to ask this question, didn't want to go on mic and say, they have money that they have set aside for their golden years, and they're worried that even though they don't go online a lot, they do banking online, they're worried that they'll wake up one morning, check their balance, and find out they're empty. How great of a risk is that to anyone, that you, through just circumstance, you're going to wake up and find you have no money? Could that ha Does it happen a lot, Brad? So, uh, you know, I'm in the field uh, where this stuff is actually taking place with normal people in mainstream lives. Um, we started, again, with individuals, but ultra high net worth families and individuals working with family offices and those that really thought a lot about risk management, including kidnapping risk and other elements that they were sort of selected, uh, selective toward. 
But now uh, that's coming way down the food chain. So there's no reason to panic as these things go, but there is reason to be aware and to think about activities and think about mitigating this risk because it absolutely does take place and creates profound distress for people because it's enormously unfair. You didn't cheat, you didn't do anything bad, but they right. gotcha. Didn't you tell a story when you visited us last fall about a company that the scam went on for a while and somebody lost like $9 million. They were a chief executive of a company. Do you recall something like this? Yeah, um, so I was in the business of Wall Street where it's all about risk, right? And risk and return and measuring risk. And I worked with a gentleman that was considered one of the smartest on Wall Street, which is a pretty high bar. Um, he was paid $52 million in 2007 by a bank that gave him full discretion over their balance sheet to trade it every single day as he saw fit. It was $100 billion that he traded every day. And he's, he was able to look all over the world at securities and instruments and decide whether they were overpriced or underpriced according to the risk that was inherent in that, um, in that security. So he would go long or short these securities, leverage, and he was so smart and so good that this bank paid him $52 million for one year's work. A few years after this, I tell this story because it's really uh, pretty profound, he was known as a master of the universe risk manager, right, if you remember that term on Wall Street, master of the universe risk manager. A short few years after 2007, he and his wife were buying a $20 million apartment in Manhattan, and he was doing it over his AOL email account, and he was doing it without a lot of um, consideration to privacy and security and passwords and what have you, and the $2 million down payment for that $20 million um, townhome was confis was, is gone. There was a man in the middle, it was rewired to a Bitcoin account, $2 million gone. So my point in telling the story is, here's a master of the universe risk manager, and sort of the traditional set of risk metrics and how you think about it in the digital age, and completely missed his number one risk today to the point where he lost $2 million, he has nobody to sue, and there's no chance of recovery whatsoever. It's we'll be picking back example. on that too about um, having your files taken hostage, your pictures, your money, all that stuff. Um, what's the best way to guard against it? Just general hacking? Are we talking yeah. about ransomware? We're talking about ransomware. I'm sorry. Ransomware. Okay, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I, I want to be sure because ransomware was the number one malware of 2017. So I and the fastest growing crime on the planet. Oh yeah, and 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 it's a great crime um, as a business model. As crimes go, it's a well, great well, crime. Well, well, yeah, as, as crimes go, I mean, it, it's morally reprehensible, but it is very, very clever. Basically, ransomware is exactly what the the, the word implies. Um, I'm somehow able to implant some malware on your computer, um, and I make your files inaccessible to you. So you get a splash screen coming up saying, "Hey, you've been hit by whatever this ransomware," and um, if you pay, let's say, I think the going rate was, if you pay $300 within the next three days, I'll give you a decryption key so you can get all your files back. If you don't pay within three days, it goes up to $600, and then you have a week. And if you don't pay the $600 within a week, forget it, you'll never get your files back, because I will never give you the key. And um, so you need to pay me by Bitcoin, it's one of the cryptocurrencies, um, here's the address of my wallet to send it to. Um, oh, you don't know how to use Bitcoin? No problem. Here's the help desk number. And if you call or send email. A we help will, desk number for a crime. We will tell you how to create for yourself a Bitcoin wallet. We will tell you how to move money into the wallet and how you can move money from your wallet to my wallet. And with probability of nearly one, if you pay the money, I will give you the decryption key. Because if I don't give you the decryption key, you're going onto social media and say, I was hit by the following ransomware, I paid them the money, and they didn't give me my key, no one else will give me money. I don't care about your files. I don't want your files. I want your money. So I'm going to be a legitimate and honest crook. And that is what ransomware is all about. And you would be amazed at the number of companies that have gotten hit. Um, or the, individuals, or, or individuals. It's our number one source of new business it, it, is ransomware. Yeah. Really? It, and, to get and, them through it? to get them through it and get them in a place, because they'll come back. To Gary's oh, point, absolutely. they want you to know they'll make good on their deal, because they're going to come back. Yeah. And they're going to want yeah. the same deal, and they know you're going to tell your neighbor about it, and they want to do the deal with your neighbor. Yeah. 
It's the evolution of extortion. It's as easy as ordering a pizza online. Um, the guy that hacked it, you know, you can probably buy that code or get it for free online and just yes. use it yourself. So these syndicates, these new criminal syndicates that Gary um, and Philip were talking about, are, yeah, they are really happening. Some of the criminal syndicates were traditional. They may have run drugs or weapons or something else. They're getting into this gig because of the risk and return and upside versus downside. You don't need a weapon. Your currency is liquid, portable, and anonymous. It's a perfect crime. And the right? anonymity is the key. Exactly. And I, there are, in fact, neighborhoods in Russia. Some of them have been, you know, by old industrial plants or something, and there may be of a, a terrible economic situation, but there are entire neighborhoods that are being built on, the, on this industry of ransomware because it's not illegal in Russia to do this as long as you do it outside of Russia, as long as your victims are outside of Russia. Yeah. Phil Krager. So you don't even need to be technical to do these kinds of things because you can get on the dark web and there's cyber criminals selling these services uh, for, for rent. Money. Hacking it's, is it's, a service. It's hacking as a service or cybercrime as a service. So let's tech say, support for crooks? It, no, it's not tech support. It's actually I want to attack somebody or I want this kind of ransomware. Right. And they'll say, okay, well, uh, let's say they want to run a distributed model of service attack against a company. Okay, we'll sell you uh, this botnet of 50,000 uh, zombies for a week. It's going to cost you $5,000. You don't need to know anything about it. You just need to be able to point this toward the target and tell it to go. We can put this in terms that Mark will understand. Okay. You want to take Rush Limbaugh off the air? Buy a hacker as a service. <clears throat> we knock him off the air for you. Wow. <laughs> and and, and, and it, is, it is that simple. The, these people can be found. Again, you pay them by Bitcoin. It is anonymous money. There's so many areas to still get into, and we only have a limited time. Let's start getting questions. Come down to the two microphones, ask your questions. We're opening it up. We'd love to have students first. Please tell us your field of study and the year that you're in. Come right down while we wait for our first students or people to come down to either microphone. Let's talk about Uber for just a moment here. What, what role is the internet playing in Uber? The New York Times and CBS reported that there will be a reduction of almost 40% of truckers in the next 10 to 15 years because of these self-driven trucks. Kind of hard to believe that they're going to do this well, in We, we were talking area. about this at dinner. As long as they're on the freeway, when there's a finite number of things that can happen, they're probably safer than, obviously, downtown streets in Arizona. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I mean, is this all going to be done through the internet, or are they going to have, like, some kind of a micro-internet to do this? I, yeah, I didn't think they were internet-based. I, th I thought they were, the, the, the autonomous vehicles were truly autonomous. Okay. They do rely on GPS. Yeah. yeah, yeah, see, so then I wonder, does the internet come into this or not, no? I don't think it's a big factor. I don't believe so. Okay, so that's one thing we don't have to worry about, just having a no-driver truck. Well, what one thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, thank you for being here, right into the microphone. So while the students are queuing up, uh, this is one for Gary. This uh -oh. is from Buddy Tidwell. Do you remember Buddy Tidwell? He's the vice president of Cellubrite. You might want to tell us a little bit more about that. You but need to tell him who you are. Oh, my name is J.T. Shim. I have a PhD in MIS, Management Information Systems. I did teach two cybersecurity courses once uh, each. But the question for you, Gary, is what about the security challenges posed by the IoT, Internet of Things? <laughs> and I have a half a dozen other questions, but we'll... But luckily, you're only allowed one. At least now. We'll come back for um, a second one for so, you, Doctor. So, so for those of you that are not familiar with the term the Internet of Things, um, also known as the Internet of Everything, the general idea is literally we want to plug every device, everything, and everything can be a device, into the Internet for Internet control. So if you've got like a smart TV or, for that matter, a, a smart refrigerator, I mean, basically the idea is, well, we used to joke about this in Vermont, you know, when, when I would have my, my, my Internet-capable, uh, you know, chocolate maker, when I'm coming off of the ski slope, I can call my house and tell my house to start heating up and, by the way, make me hot chocolate. So when I get home, it's all ready for me. Um, and, and, and so I think there's an estimate of something like 50 or 70 billion devices on the internet by 2025. Now the problem with the internet of things, the, the big problem, is that these are consumer grade devices. And so to make the consumer grade, they're relatively inexpensive. Frequently what that means is the device has a burned in username and password, which even if you could get to the device, you can't change the password. Well, that means I've got a device on the internet that has, that every 
you know, every model XYZ refrigerator now has the same password. Well, one can merely go to Google and Google hacked IoT database, and you'll get a list of all the devices currently known now um, by make and model and what their password is. So you can now go in and break into those devices um, if you can find them. Well, you can find them because there are other sites online uh, where you can actually look for all these types of devices. Um, there was a bad hack in October of 16. Was that a right? DIN hack? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was an ISP up in New England was brought off the air by distributed denial of service attack. And almost all of the attacking devices were IoT devices that had been compromised. Um, by the way, if you have a smart TV, um, smart TVs respond to your voice commands, right? That's because the TV is always listening, right? It is always listening, whether you're giving it a command or not. And again, all sorts of stories have come out about, you know, cosmic headquarters for the TV is listening to everything you say. Um, I, I, I like having a, a dumb TV. I, I liked when the, my remote control was my six-year-old. Joshua, can you please turn on channel 10? Mm -hmm. And you know, that was, that was the best. So. Wow. Welcome to another exciting episode of Science Fantastic. Your question now. Hello, my name is Mark. I'm a currently an aerospace engineering student here. I have a quick question for all of you guys. Well, hold, slow it down just a little Sorry. bit so the old guys like me can follow. Of Go. course. Um, so basically, when our data is stolen from a social media account, what exactly is being stolen? Um, and what exactly are they going to do with that? I know one of the most common ways is they buy it and they sell it. But why are they selling it? And what exactly are they taking to sell? For example, if someone were to like hack your refrigerator, if it gets connected, why would they do that? <laughs> From your social media account? Is this, just a, is this the, the account where you, you voluntarily gave your information? Yeah, so it's like that, but it's like what kind it? of information are they taking? Like if I post a picture of me out to dinner with my friends, what does that do for well, you know, like a company? The, I, well, I think there's, or a, government there's or, a couple of different questions there. Um, the companies, Facebook and the companies with whom they work, they're not stealing your information. They're using it to try to influence things, try to influence to buy things or trying to influence people to vote on things. Uh, if somebody logs in to, is able to steal data from your Facebook account, if you don't have anything sensitive on your Facebook account, and what I've seen from a lot of students is they're willing to put a lot of different types of sensitive information on there, then you, that could be used for various nefarious purposes. So those are really a couple of questions. Uh, Brad, addition, then Gary, then we'll go back to the an, an important term to really understand, again, for future of survival and success in the digital age is metadata. That's one word, metadata. And if you look it up, it says it's information about information. Something that we, even intuitively and intellectually for that matter, really underestimate is the power of a lot of information. It may be boring, each little piece. It may be mundane, each little piece. It may be meaningless, each little piece. But the value of information does not grow numerically. If you have five pieces of information, it doesn't make it five times more than having one piece. It makes it exponentially more valuable. So when you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of pieces of information, even those little pieces that don't mean anything collectively can mean a lot. And so very powerful software is mining that to predict what you're going to buy, what you like, what you'll read, what you don't read. And we are being, in a lot of cases, manipulated by these algorithms. And so you just have to be pretty thoughtful about what you're contributing to that and not underestimate the value of a lot of, in, of your personal information in the hands of somebody else. Yeah, I, I think the thing that I would add to that is that I'm not going to Facebook trying to steal a little bit of information about you. A criminal group, maybe, is trying to get a lot of the information that is being leaked. Um, I call this information leakage because right now there's all sorts of software and I, and I show this in a couple of my classes where if I just go and I look up Gary Kessler, I can find all the social linkages from Gary Kessler. In fact, I can find every email address and phone number associated with me going back about 20 or 25 years, including Gary Kessler's who aren't even me. Um, and by finding those linkages, I can also find linkages to other people. So when I start looking at all of the social media, and on Facebook, you only put your date of birth. But I can link you to a Twitter account over here where you put other stuff. And by the time I get done with the data mining, I've got a very, very nice profile about you. That, and that's where 
I can start to impersonate you for, for credit purposes. I probably don't want to steal money from most of the students because most of you don't have any money. But, um, <laughs> but, but the point being, of course, is that I can start getting pretty good pictures of the persona um, for whatever purposes. It may, it may be theft, it may be manipulation, stuff like that. So you know, it's, it's all of this stuff together. You have to wonder, with all of the HIPAA laws that are out there, could that data could also be used to mine out people's health records? If you have put it there, because the HIPAA, I, I, I found that the HIPAA compliance is pretty good, although the security at, on medical systems is pretty poor. Okay, let's come over here now. Your question, good evening. Right into the mic, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Thompson. I'm an aeronautical science major here, working on my commercial pilot's license, and I'm a cybersecurity minor. Um, I, they, we put a lot of effort in uh, airports today and security uh, to stop terrorists from hacking or putting bombs on planes. Um, with as computerized as airplanes are coming, is it a potential threat uh, that they could hack into airplanes and uh, do whatever they wanted? Are we taking that threat seriously? We're taking it seriously, yes. Are we fixing it? No. Um, Part of the problem with many of the aviation systems, as, as you know, is you know we're still flying planes that were built 20, 25 years ago, which meant they were designed 30 or 35 years ago with the processor of the day. And while we can upgrade the software, we can only upgrade it so much, but we're, st but we're not upgrading processors. Um, there have been all sorts of examples um, recently uh, un under appropriate tests and all. Um, there, there was one last year, DHS, basically, um, on the ground, taking over a plane, using stock standard commercial off-the-shelf products and not using any in particular insider knowledge. Obviously, they knew about the plane, but there was nobody on the plane helping them. And so it, it, it's a big problem, and um, it's, it's being addressed. But Is it being addressed in next-gen study, do you think, next generation? Um, I, I can't speak specifically to that because I don't know. Okay. Um, I, my, when I was first introduced to NextGen several years ago, I asked about security and was told, well, we'll take care of this on implementation, which mm. any engineer will tell you is the exact wrong place to do it. Right. Okay. Um, let's come over here. Your question. Good evening. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. My name is Mitchell Ward. I'm an aeronautics major uh, with a minor in Homeland Security. Uh, so as college students, we have our pop culture and the things that we're into. And there's actually a video game called Watch Dogs. Maybe somebody in this room knows what that is. Uh, but basically the premise behind the game is it's an open world city um, and you are somebody who is uh, very familiar with the ability to hack into basically anything. Everything and everything that can be traffic lights, that can be personal devices, uh, literally any kind of system that you can imagine. And you become this person with you know, you're intentionally left with an ambiguous character who can do either good actions or bad actions, and it gives you that power as the player to do that. That's, I guess, part of the fun of it. Okay, but um, you have immense power in that position. So this is something that's fictitious and, uh, you know, maybe not representative of exactly what's going on right now, but to kind of paint the picture a little bit, you can walk around the city, and you can take out your phone, and maybe you can switch the traffic light in the middle of you know, something happening and, and cars crash, causes a major accident. Maybe you can tap into, uh, the gentleman over there was mentioning aircraft, maybe you can tap into a helicopter flying overhead. Maybe you can tap into somebody's, um, what is it, it's not Siri, but the female. Alexa. Yeah, Alexa. Alexa, yes, maybe you can tap into that, and maybe if something has a camera, you can just watch somebody's living room activities Amazon and so key. what I'm going to with this is I just want to ask you um, this game puts the player in a very powerful position where the possibilities do seem pretty endless and it does seem as a society that we are moving closer and closer to somebody having that capability even just with an iPhone to be able to do that so what do you gentlemen think about that and and how close to a future of that do you think we're getting to I mean like a cyber app crime Cyber app? Yes, sir. Well, you yeah. know, I, I, I always think about Amazon Key um, when, when you talk about hacking into the. Everybody know what Amazon Key is? Yes. Amazon Key was this thing from Amazon where they were saying, well, look at, you know, we're going to deliver stuff to you and you might not be home. Well, you don't want to leave a package on your front 
porch. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide a mechanism whereby the delivery person can actually enter your home and, and put this in your home. Now, okay, I can see already not many of you are happy with that. Well, we have a solution to that because we're going to put a camera in your house. So when they come in the house, you can actually see them coming in, leaving it there and all that kind of stuff, except they found you could hack the camera. So the camera takes a picture of the front door and keeps it there. So while the guy enters your house and walks out with your smart TV, there you go. Anyway, when, he, when he walks out with stuff, it's still showing the image of your front door closed. So, um, so I, 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 w I was flashing on that for a while. Um, it was also flashing on the fact that my favorite movie is Sneakers, 25 years old, but if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a good movie and speaks to that. Brad? So it's a great question, and I think about these things all the time. I used a term earlier called the democratization of global power. That's essentially, these are godlike capabilities that anybody can access. I don't know how it's going to end, to tell you the truth. I know some people that are a lot smarter than I am and have thought about it a lot longer, and they don't necessarily um, sense it the same way as I do. But I think that ultimately, when we talk about China and we talk about some of these other things, and we're talking about this particular issue, artificial intelligence and quantum-based uh, computing is really going to be, I think, the hinge where all this changes for the good or the bad depending on who has that power, and China has a lot of advantages here, and who gets there first and how they use that in these types of wild environments that you're describing, which we're at the doorstep of right now. Alexa's at the doorstep of being on the witness stand. Yeah, you know? I, I, that was where I was gonna go next. Yep. Do you think that Alexa usage is gonna expand, or are we gonna have a stutter step because people are hearing the horror stories, and that very thing, are they gonna have them in hotel rooms and then divorce court starts, you know? I mean, what about that? Will Alexa increase or how, will it level off? I haven't seen any of these things really decrease or backstep much that makes any difference in the long-term trend. So I have to assume, you know, like a lot of technology, it's kind of predictable, the pace and the rate and where it's going to end up. The implications, you know, are harder to figure out, but I don't think there's any getting away from it, no. Want to take a bite at that apple, Gary, on Alexa? No, I, I would just sort of, no, I, I, I think it's next to impossible for us to figure out the implications. We don't know where technology is going to be in two years. If and we look back 10 years, would we know that we would be here now? I don't think we would. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why it's so incomprehensible still to so many. When we talk about aircraft and the safety of airports and aircraft, and we talk about these things, ultimately we're coming down to the human level and how we prepare, how we adapt. Adaptation is a really big deal. And take on certain life skills that are really different from what we've had to have in the past. Your question now for our panel tonight. Right into the microphone so we can hear you. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Michael Starkowski. I am a senior with a double major in both Homeland Security and Air Traffic Management. My question is uh, more related to the Russian hacking. Uh, I saw it as more of a counterintelligence issue because, uh, in my mind, nations have been conducting these sort of operations for years, but it just hasn't been a, in a cyber realm. Uh, just because of the nature of our democracy, we can't have great firewalls and things like that. So are we going to be falling behind as these things continue to happen? Or do you think we can develop uh, programs that can counter these uh, attacks and have attacks of our own? I, I think there's two questions. I think one is our defensive capability and one is our offensive capability. Correct. OK. I think our offensive capability is, is actually quite good. Um, I, I don't know that it is necessarily second to none, but, but we're right up there in, in offensive capability. Um, the defensive capability is, is difficult. As you said, I, I, you know, um, Brad talks about the democratization of global power. You used to talk about the democratization of risk. Um, and, and I think that because of the free society that we have, both in cyberspace and real space, um, I, I refuse to acknowledge that as a weakness of this country, but it is certainly a vulnerability. And so we have to work together to not let it be a weakness. But, but I think we're still very, very vulnerable. Thank you. Over here. Uh, good evening. My name is Maxwell Dunphy. I'm a, uh, in my third year of UAS. I'm in aircraft systems science uh, with a minor in Homeland Security. I was curious about your uh, how you guys thought cybersecurity was going for unmanned aircraft and the future on how we're going to take steps to take precautions in it. 
that's one of the things I'm researching right now, especially with SUAs, SUASs, the hobbyist drones. Um, you know, you can buy some for two or three hundred dollars. They're really not going to have any security to them. Uh, I've got a couple of drones that I use to hack into. They're flying. I'm able to, to log in, hack. I can download the, the files that are on there. I can change the files. Uh, I can uh, spoof the GPS. I can make kernel adaptations that are going to change the behavioral characteristics of the SUAS. So that's a, it's a big deal when you're talking about the cheaper drones. If you start take, talking about the more um, the military grade drones, then that's in a whole other category, obviously. But if you recall in 2011, there was a, a sentinel that was taken down in Iran, and Iran said that they were able to, to, to spoof the GPS to force it to land. And so it, it appears that perhaps it may be even military drones may be susceptible to those types of attacks if that was certainly the case. I, I think the use of drones as terrorist weapons is becoming increasingly um, uh, of increasing concern um, of my either taking over um, a drone because I mean so so even the, the SUASs we're talking about a 55 pound device then go 100 miles an hour if I can take your device over by the time I've taken it over and can do something bad with it like drive it at high speed into the Goodyear blimp um, while it's sitting on top of the uh, the the, air, the, um, the raceway yeah it's restricted airspace sure and, by, and who's going to shoot down a 55-pound device going 100 miles an hour? Um, so by the time we realize there's a problem, and, and so I, I think that's, that's some of the issues that's also coming up. Drones are becoming way more prevalent, um, and, and the small ones, as Phil's observing, don't have a lot of security. Over here, good evening, sir. Thank right. you for being here. Good evening. Here. My name is Mark. I'm a uh, resident in Ponce Inlet. Um, I have, my question is about... Um, Cryptocurrencies. Um, I'm actively uh, into it. I've been making very good money at it so far. Last year would have been a great <clears throat> um, year for you. But just like anything, it could disappear in a heartbeat. Um, fortunately, I'm only 700 bucks into it, so I'm going to call it a good day at the casino if that happened. <laughs> but I've also casino made. Of the heavens, but I've also made mean? close to 75,000 on it. Right. Wow. So. <clears throat> My question one is security coming to United States with the new Coinbase that's being accepted um, since the Super Bowl ad that's been pushed, uh, the Coinbase and the Litecoin Pay with the QR code readers, um, and with the states like Arizona looking at now taking Bitcoin payment for uh, tax payment back to the state. Mm -hmm. Where are we going with security for this and how? I guess, uh, how fast are we coming with it? You know, I know crypto is a big, cryptocurrency in this country is uh, half accepted and half not accepted, you know? Oh. But, and I think it's a, strictly because it's a tangible. You can't, this is a sample of a Litecoin or a Bitcoin, but you're never gonna touch your money. So. And this is hard to understand for a lot of people who may, and I'm just learning from Gary and this group, is there gonna be like a commerce bank of Crypto, there's no central banking. It's all based on faith, right? Because it's, you know, there's, no, there's nothing that backs it up. It's not a secured currency, correct? Correct. It's not backed no, it's by not gold. It's not backed by anything, is it? Neither no. is the U.S. dollar. It's, it's, it, well, yes, but the U.S. dollar, as I observe, is backed by the U.S. Army. Um, however, however, cryptocurrency is backed up because people have, have faith in it. Okay. And like they have faith in the U.S. dollar. But when you say cryptocurrency, that assumes that it's one thing, and it's really right. not. Right. It's, it's dozens and dozens of different types of cryptocurrency, each of which has their own user base and, and different types of algorithms and different infrastructure. And so those all differ you know, somewhat. Right now, the big one is Bitcoin, but that might not be so next week, right. year, and it could be Ethereum. But, but and, I, and you said you're using Litecoin? I'm doing Litecoin and another one called Cardano which is uh, in the top 10 of the coins, and their project is coming out with a uh, usable debit card by the end of this year. Okay. I got lost at Drachma, so. So it's, you you know, it's a very interesting thing. It, 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 it seems very believable, it's tangible. I've spent the money and I've had things delivered to my house. I, you know. I, in the interest of time, will there but be yes. anything to secure it? Well, so. I, I, I think it would be fair to say that the cryptocurrency is safe. The security is the protection of the blockchain ledger, and, and they have been some ways that people have stolen or, or put up a bogus ledger, which is bad, um, or the security of your wallet, because you lose your wallet, 
your money's gone. Right. But cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Yes. There's, yes. That under no uncertain terms, they're here to yes. stay. Yes. There's no protection on FDIC for it, so it's kind of where it's, where it's one of those scary things. But right. Thanks for your time. The Federal Reserve Board Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, here we go. Your question. Hi, uh, I'm Zach Stanley. I'm a freshman here, major is Homeland Security. Um, my question is, uh, personally, each one of you, um, are you guys willing to give up uh, certain personal liberties or rights for you guys to stay uh, secured in like, this new modern day of you know, cyber attacks? Benjamin Franklin would say no. Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> Benjamin Franklin would say you lose both, right? It's, yeah, you lose both. Um, Am I willing to give up privacy for security? Yes. Or freedoms for liberties for security? No. Oh, um, I, I, um, I, I, I actually use the Benjamin Franklin quote all the time, although I don't agree with it totally. Um, we have given up liberty to have security. I think as soon as we joined societies, we gave up certain freedoms. Um, I do not believe that every freedom we give up is a slippery slope to losing all of them. I think we are constantly in a balance trying to figure out what those are. That's Brad, a, you get the last word. A, a debate for the age. There's no yeah. question. And I think in the next election cycle, presidential election cycle, it will actually be an issue yeah. that is debated thoroughly, and that will be the start of it. But where it pans out, and you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough to determine. Running time tells me we'll take this question, then these two here. Sir, your question. Good evening. Hi. Uh, my name is Jimmy Carter, and I work with a group from uh, Disney, and we've been focused on um, uh, visual observation or, like, it's uh, the geometric face. I mean, if you, if you have control of it and you want to just recognize every employee that you have. Facial recognition? Facial recognition. I mean, 15 years ago, we could do that if it's set, but we went on the mission of developed a 3D camera where you could play back right away. And we use that for the military to uh, put it in front of tanks and put it in front of Humvees so they would facially recognize everything that they could see and it would come back on the computer in AI so they would and rate the most dangerous people in the crowd. Now, that's tactical, but we want to bring it over to um, practical and use that in uh, protecting uh, our soft targets. So we could, and it also, the AI picks up if they're acting funny or walking funny or they're doing anything out of the ordinary, it notifies security and security is like, why is this guy walking faster than everybody else now? He might've lost a child or he might've needs to go to the bathroom or he might be carrying a bomb. Forgive me, sir. Do you have a question that just comes to you? I'm fighting the clock here. Okay, sorry. It's, uh, is AI uh, really the next hardcore thing that we're going to AI? Have? Could you define Art what AI artificial is? Intelligence. Brad? Artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence. intelligence. Yeah. And so I think the best way to wrap your head around what that really means and implies for the future is, you know, the Industrial Revolution we talk about a lot and how that dislocated or relocated a lot of things. And some people adapted and some didn't. Um, and that was because machines were taking over the ability to use our um, manual functioning, our human functioning, right? Here with AI, we're talking about replacing our cognitive functioning. And that's a whole different conversation. And, and the implications are far deeper and more meaningful than but even what we had in the industrial. To follow the gentleman, though, we're being pushed in that direction, yes? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Be and probably because of labor costs as part of it? Sure, productivity, and it's just the natural trend of the way technology and information evolves in humanity's use of it. And it's just, really inevitable. But the, the data mining that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. is a form of AI. There, there you go. And there will be a chance to follow up as soon as our program completes. Right over here, your question now. Um, good evening. My name is Emily Solomon. I'm a freshman with a major in Homeland. Um, we had this question in Dr. Krager's class um, with cyber warfare and cyber terrorism. Um, there's still a bunch of blurred lines about it, and I wanted to have your input um, if there is a difference and what is the difference between the two um, regarding um, like Ukraine and the power outages and things of that sort. Is there any way that you could clear up those lines? 
Now, if you become a cybersecurity minor and take HS 485, we spend an entire semester um, splitting that up from cyber diplomacy. Um, I, I, I think. I think if you start with the basics of is there a difference between terrorism and war, you can sort of intuit what the difference is between cyber war and cyber terror are. Partially it's who's carrying it out, who are they targeting, what is the intent, what are the methods, what are the rules, if any. That help? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good luck to you. And this final question. Hey there. Uh, my name is Noah Mustin Phillips. I'm a freshman with a Homeland Security major, and I already have a cybersecurity minor. So I'm also in Dr. Krager's class, but we've heard a lot about um, using cyber warfare, cyber terrorism to knock out electrical grids, bring down planes, and stuff like that, which would be done in the past with conventional weapons and explosives. Do you see cyber replacing kinetic and explosive weapons or making them obsolete so that we're no longer building tons of tanks and stuff, and instead we're all just hacking each other? I don't, I don't think that cyber is going to replace Connecticut. Connecticut? Kinetic. 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 Um, Kinetic. Not, not there's, Connecticut. There, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different areas where I think we're still going to need people and physical things in order to implement our warfare strategies. But when, when, you, can, when you can cause millions of dollars in damage and thousands of lives just by pushing a button, doing it over the internet. That's primarily why that a lot of nation states are moving towards cyber, not to mention what we discussed before in terms of attribution. Um, I don't think it's going to replace it. And, and, and clearly we've already identified it as the fifth domain of war. So I, I think they'll all continue to work together. Finally, I have a question for Brad. When people come to you with problems, maybe it's a large family, they're going to hire you privately or a company, is there a, a process? In other words, people can go to your company online, yeah. Total Digital yeah. Securities, and fill out a questionnaire and all that, and then do you do an interview to see what they need? Yeah, yeah more or less. You know, we think about topology in, in the business, and so the topology is people, the devices they use, and the environments that they operate in. Now, the environments now are very mobile in a lot of, to a lot of cases. They're not fixed. But when we can determine the people, the personas, what their risks are, what their needs are, when we can determine the devices they use, and we can t determine the environments that they operate in, even if they are mobile, we can provide solutions to try to create some sort of an ecosystem in which they can operate on the internet and always be secure, or as secure as you can be these days. Finally, I want to thank uh, Sundus and Diego, our students who worked with us tonight, and Tony Petro up in control and to this wonderful panel. Don't move anyone yet. We want to tell you something we're going to do in a week when the series reconvenes. It'll be at an early time. Dr. Stephen Kratchik is here to talk about Frankenstein, artificial intelligence, and transhumanism. Trans uh, translated, technology versus ethics. Uh, professor Kratchik is a professor of religious studies at Emory University, and he is our guest in the Harry and Ada edition, Harry and Ada Lehman edition of the speaker series. Note the time, 5 o'clock before dinner. 5 o'clock, doors open at 4, we'll be right here in the Gail Lemeron Auditorium. Once again, I want to thank our panel, Dr. Philip Krager, Dr. Gary Kessler, and Brad Deflin. Thank you, gentlemen, for making this such a fun discussion. And thank you all for coming tonight. We'll see you next week. Thank you all for coming. Have a very pleasant evening.